Well, today we're in Campo Seco, California, which is Spanish for dry field. And we're going to show you some quite interesting things of this little historic town. And did you know that Campo Seco once petitioned to be the state capital of California? And we will also be looking at the claim that Campo Seco has the largest living cork oak tree in California. So get comfortable and come on a journey with us to the dry field known as Campo Seco, California. The mining town of Campo Seco was founded in 1849 by a group of Mexicans. Campo Seco translates in Spanish to dry field and it was appropriately named this for the lack of water in the area. In the early 1850s, Campo Seco had a population of over 3,000 people with 40 different nationalities all working together to mine gold. Okay, we are now in front of the Adams Express building, at least what's left of it. And here stands the Campo Seco State Registered Landmark Placard number 257. On the placard, it states that Campo Seco has the largest living cork oak tree in California. So we're going to go head out and try to find that tree. At one time before the water sources began to dry up, these fields were planted with orchards such as almonds and orange trees. They even had wheat fields planted amongst these dry hills. Okay, we are now standing at the brow of the hill and in front of us is the Mauer house and there to the left is a cork oak tree but we don't believe that's the largest tree so we're still looking up here huh. now on the other side of the house we found that big old cork oak tree but upon doing some research we found an old article from 1968 written in a newspaper and this is what it said much like the story of the magic bean so grew the tree planted by Ed Maurer on his ranch in Campo Seco in 1858 it thrived like no other cork oak tree in California. Every year, acorns from this tree were sent to the University of California for experiments. Mr. Maurer took great care of this beautiful giant, and every nine years it was debarked. However, as in the rule of what God grows, man finds a way to destroy. The final debarking in about 1940 was so severe that it killed the tree. It was John McKay that was so intrigued with the cork harvesting over in Spain that he brought over acorns. He planted the first one in 1858 on the top of this hill. The old timers would call it the brow of the hill. So if you come to this area, you can still see a handful of these old oaks. Okay, this is the bark off a cork oak tree. And it is actually just cork. So what they do is they use an axe and they kind of score the cork and then they kind of pop it off in big chunks. Um, and they can do this every nine years and the tree lives for about 200 years so you'll get 15 plus harvests out of each oak tree. We're now headed to some of the mining area. We're gonna put our backpacks on and go ahead and hike in. There were several gold mines in the area with two different mining techniques used. The first was placer and the second hard rock. 
placer mining comes in many forms. It is the practice of separating heavily eroded minerals like gold from sand and gravel. Another technique that accelerated the placer mining process was hydraulicy. By constructing a penstock, which is a wood and earthen reservoir of creek water, and installing a system of sectional pipes, miners could create enough water pressure to blast away large amounts of earth. The Penn Mine also had well over 20 underground shafts. Shaft number 5 is 400 feet deep on the incline. The total workings underground were about 55,000 feet. 42,000 feet were in drifts and crosscuts. And there is also numerous vent shafts that can be seen from the surface. There is a hiking trail out here, so we decided to hike around for a few miles and do some exploring. We came upon numerous wells that were exposed. You had to be careful where you step, as well as many other stone structures and walls that had us quite puzzled. There are numerous open mining pits with very steep walls. One thing about hiking and exploring, you never know what you might find. I thought it might be a homeless camp, but there was no garbage or activity. This is federal land and all motor vehicles are prohibited. All the gates are locked and the roads have been blocked. As we got closer, we found out it was a 1992 Suzuki. We also stumbled upon maybe an old miner's camp. In 1958, after many years and several closings and reopenings, the Penn Mine closed their doors for good and the property was subleased to a Valley Spring resident by the name of Kenneth Boyles until 1959, when all the operations were suspended and the mine closed for good. We are now at the junction of Watertown and Campo Seco Roads. This area is right on the outskirts of Lake Pardee, operated by East Bay Mud. We locals drive by this reservoir all the time, not knowing the history behind this little body of water. This body of water was essential for the mining district of Campo Seco. There are now roads and development in this area but back in the 1800s, this valley was flooded. This body of water goes unnoticed today, but back in the 1800s, it was known as Jane's Reservoir. And Jane's Reservoir has quite an interesting fact in Campo Seco's history. There was a doctor in Campo Seco by the name of Andrew Lee. Dr. Lee and his friend made a homemade boat and they were anxious to get it out on the water. So they took it down to what was then known as Jane's Reservoir. They got into the boat and started paddling towards the middle of the reservoir. But unfortunately, the boat sprung a leak and began taking on water. Dr. Lee was frantically bucketing out the water in hopes that they could continue their maiden voyage, but bystanders were yelling at him to hurry up and return to shore. 
Unfortunately, Dr. Lee didn't listen to them and the boat sank and Dr. Lee drowned. Dr. Andrew Lee died June 8, 1872 at the age of 45 years old after drowning in Jane's Reservoir. There's a quaint schoolhouse that shares the hilltop with the Protestant cemetery. And in 1976, the bell was stolen out of the school's belfry. It wasn't until several years later that some of the residents were at a Calaveras High School football game and heard the familiar ring of that bell. They succeeded in getting the bell back and then decided to mount it on top of the historical marker there located on Main Street. But unfortunately, it was stolen yet again and returned again. But this time, a Camposeco resident kept it for safekeeping. This was the post office. It was established in 1854 and it closed down in 2019. I remember on summer days you would drive by and they would just leave the front door open. Now we're gonna cross the street and walk on down to the general store. Okay, this is the general store and like most things in Campo Seco, there is very little information on anything in this little town. One thing that we do know, this is the Cool Cafe. The Cool Cafe would serve beer and alcohol down in the cellar below this store. And the reason why we know this is Calaveras Community TV did a great show on Mabel Pereira, who was the owner of this general store. So there was a bar here, and where was the entrance? Right here. Oh, downstairs. Yeah. Oh, we had more fun. It was cool. You, you could come out here and almost smother, and you could go down there, and in five minutes you were cool. It's a cool cafe is what we call it. And if you're ever wondering what this little store looked like in its day, Calaveras Community TV now, captured this part of history go, also. Gold mining, gold. You could take this. Oh, that's a small gold yeah, pan. Yeah, gold pan. It's been used a lot, but it's a nice display thing. Ajax Company. Some nice men's shoes here. I don't know whose they were. Epsom salt. You know what that is. Sure do. <laughs> I see you still have apple juice in the bottle. Do I wear it? Oh, yeah. God, that looks like good enough to drink. <laughs> Yeah. So here's a fun fact about Campo Seco that involves our state's capital. Back in the mid to late 1800s, the capital had moved around so many times that a petition was started by the Campo Seco townsfolk asking that the state capital might be located at Campo Seco Calaveras County. Something of a joke, it was considered elsewhere. But as the capital had been changed repeatedly and a proposal for another change was before the legislator, everybody from Calaveras County signed it. Friends of a convicted murderer got a hold of it, cut off the top, attached the signatures to a recommendation for pardon, and the man received executive clemency. Campo Seco had a Chinese settlement on the edge of town included a store and their own cemetery. There were many Chinese gold miners, and a story has been told of a yearly ceremony called Queen Ming, which is known in English as Tomb Sweeping Day. This is where the Chinese would honor their departed by cleaning their grave sites and cooking an elaborate meal, such as roasting pig, fruits, vegetables, and breads. And they would leave a plate of this delicious food each gravesite. Because the townspeople were aware of this ritual, it is said they would wait for the Chinese to return to their homes. Then they would head on down to the Chinese cemetery and enjoy a hearty plate of roasted pig with all the trimmings. Then, the next day, when the plates were found empty, the Chinese had indeed thought 
that they had fed their dead. Well, what a wonderful time this was, spending time in Campo Seco, California. You never know what you'll find out when you start digging into the history of the gold country in Calaveras County. We would like to thank Calaveras Community TV for all the great programming they provide us. And also the Calaveras County Museum and Historical Society. These are the people that protect and preserve our history in this county. We welcome all your comments and ideas and tell us if there's something that you would like to see in our beautiful state. Also, if you like our content, please like and subscribe. And thank you for watching this episode of California Outdoor Adventures.